And another great day in this greatest nation on God's green earth where one of the greatest, most horrific, most storied, most talked about, most influential crimes of recent years has come under new focus. I'm talking about the brutal, horrific murder of Matthew Shepard. Remember him? 21-year-old college student in Wyoming who was left on a fence in the middle of the cold in the Wyoming high desert. He was crucified. As the account went, a martyr, and to many people a sacred martyr to the cause of gay rights and gay respect, murdered for the simple crime of being gay. Well, it's not so simple. We said that at the time. It it seemed to me that the evidence was overwhelming at the time, that he was a uh, victim of a crime of opportunity targeted uh, by a couple of miserable thugs who wanted to steal his wallet. Well, that's also not true. Uh, What is true? There is a new book about it, and it is fascinating, disturbing, in fact, shocking reading. There, There are very little that can shock you when you're in talk radio for a while, but the book of Matt, Hidden Truths About the Murder of Matthew Shepard, is in every way shocking. It's also beautifully written, compelling, and fascinating. The author, Stephen Jimenez, joins me in studio. Stephen, thanks very much for coming in. It's a pleasure to be here, Michael. Okay, first of all, to get this straight, you are in no sense justifying the killing of Matthew Shepard, which was a, a horrific crime. Of course, I could never justify the crime. It was grotesquely violent, and uh, you know there are no excuses for a crime like that. And you aren't condemning Matthew Shepard in any sense because he was gay because you yourself are a uh, an openly openly gay individual that's correct okay so uh, the the revelation why why all these 15 years later why is it so important to revisit this case well michael i think that uh violence exists exists in many forms in our culture and in the world and i think uh, hatred does as well And as I studied this case, as I researched it over the years, uh, I came to believe that understanding the complexities of this crime, uh, that it's really important, that it's important if we're serious about grappling with acts of violence of this magnitude, then it behooves us to really understand the human complexities and the circumstances surrounding it. Okay. The circumstances, there's one word that is most central to the circumstance of this crime that until your book has not come out in most of the press accounts, that word would be methamphetamines. Exactly. Uh, that was, that was uh, one of the reasons I decided to really revisit this. When I realized the size and scope of the meth crisis, which I first began looking into the meth piece uh, around 2002. And at that time, the national media was not really reporting on the meth story. And what I discovered over time was the the size of the problem in the state of Wyoming, in Laramie in particular, uh, in the years following Matthew's murder, uh, 70% of crimes were being attributed to methamphetamine by law enforcement. Uh, Wyoming also had the highest per capita rate of meth abuse in the nation. Simultaneously, methamphetamine was becoming a big problem in urban gay enclaves, uh, starting first with uh, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, but also moving on to other cities like Denver. So when I realized that methamphetamine was a part of this crime and that that had been uh, reported really minimally, I felt that it was my obligation as a journalist to really report that. 1-800-955-1776 is our phone number. The shocking information in the book, I mean, page after page, it keeps you turning the pages trying to to find more. It's extraordinarily well documented. You spent 13 years on this. I did. Uh, I will say that uh, I first went to Laramie in February of 2000, a few months after Aaron McKinney, the principal perpetrator, was convicted and sentenced. And... uh, you know, my goal was to write a screenplay for a made-for-television movie, and I went there to write the story of the anti-gay hate crime that I believed and so many other people believed. And it was about eight months uh, after I began research 
that I came upon a letter at the courthouse. It was an anonymous letter written to the prosecutor that suggested there was a whole other story here. And so it was after that that I decided to investigate. Obviously, an anonymous letter is not a reliable source, but there was an individual named in the letter, and I proceeded to investigate from there. Okay, now one of the things here is that the defense of the two murderers, and there's no question that they committed this murder, that they beat Matthew, and uh, but the the two murderers used a defense that claimed they experienced gay panic, that they were so horrified that Matthew uh, revealed that he was gay that they just couldn't contain themselves and beat him to death. It turns out that their background really doesn't support that theory. Not only does it not support it, Michael, but let me also distinguish for a moment between uh, Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson. Aaron McKinney used a gay panic defense. Russell Henderson never did. Uh, Aaron McKinney had a trial in which that was really advanced by his attorneys. Russell Henderson's case was resolved uh, with a last-minute plea bargain in the final stages of jury selection. So there was... Russell Henderson never actually used a gay panic defense. He was already sentenced to two life terms before Aaron McKinney was tried. But this was something, the, the gay panic story, it had several iterations. At the beginning, the idea was these two men walked into a bar and they targeted Matthew because he looked gay and looked like he had money. The next iteration, which came in part from Aaron McKinney's girlfriend, Kristen Price, was that... Uh, uh, Matthew Shepard had come on, made a sexual advance to Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson in the bar that night, humiliating them in front of their friends, and that that prompted them to take Matthew out uh, and beat him up, in her words, to teach him a lesson not to come on to straight people. But by the time of Aaron McKinney's trial, uh, there was yet another version. Aaron McKinney claimed that after they left the bar, once they were in the truck driving through town, that that was when uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron McKinney reached over, I mean, excuse me, Matthew Shepard reached over and grabbed, uh, uh, Matthew Shepard, he grabbed, grabbed Aaron McKinney, excuse me, right. yes, grabbed Aaron McKinney's leg and that that's what prompted Aaron McKinney to explode in violence. Okay. But none of this is true. They knew each other. They knew each other, Michael. And that was certainly one of the things that really struck me initially. Uh, what I learned is that Aaron McKinney, uh, had, was bisexual, that, uh, this letter that I found alleged that he had been involved in male hustling, you know, uh, having sex with guys for favors. I was able to track uh, track down two former bartenders at a bar in Denver where Aaron McKinney had gone, uh, apparently to sell his services there, and learned from some in law enforcement also that um, he was engaged in activities while he was in, the, in jail in Laramie. But there were a number of sources that acknowledged that Aaron McKinney was bisexual. So that was the first part. And from okay. the sexual activity, then it, I got into the methamphetamine. And, and the methamphetamine part, again, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing that Matthew Shepard, who's 21 years old, who is a very slight, small person, according to most reports, a, a very nice person. But he, he wasn't as pure as the driven snow in terms of his um, unfamiliarity with the criminal subculture in Laramie. That's correct. And what I learned, Michael, is that uh, Matthew had lived in Denver before moving to Laramie in the summer of 1998. And it was in Denver in 1997 uh, when Matthew really fell in with uh, the meth culture there. Uh, it was certainly becoming a big party drug and clubs and things like that. But it was there that he met the group of people uh, with whom he continued to be involved after he moved to Laramie in the summer of 1998. Okay, they're involved in the same group. They're all meth heads, the the two killers and Matthew. And Matthew also was was dealing in meth. Yes, he was. And uh, uh, I, I found no information that I could really prove concretely about the dealing in Denver, although he was involved with a, a group of people that were dealing. By the time he got to Laramie, they kind of set him up there. And yes, indeed, he was dealing there. And just to say, Aaron McKinney had been dealing for three years before this crime took place. He was also a methamphetamine addict for that same period of time. He became very quickly addicted. Russell Henderson used meth some, but Russell Henderson was not dealing. And I'll also add that Henderson and McKinney had only been friends for a few months before this crime happened. Okay, when we come back, uh, we will take your calls, particularly those of you who think uh, that 
that this crime shouldn't be challenged. I, I My biggest question and the biggest question raised by the book of Matt and not entirely answered by it is this material is so relevant and so important. Why is it only coming out 15 years later? We will get to that and more with Stephen Jimenez. His book, The Book of Matt, is posted on our website at michaelmedved.com. Right back with your calls. 1-800-955-1776. The Michael Medved Show. That's it. The Michael Medved Show. 1-800-955-1776. That's 1-800-955-1776. michaelmedved.com. 21 minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved show. You want to stir up some controversy? Question the iconic status of an American icon. That's what Stephen Jimenez has done, and the controversy is intense. Some of the material written about Stephen Jimenez has been vicious, uh, perhaps not unexpectedly vicious. Uh, Media Matters, the uh, left-wing group Media Matters for America, um, has now turned on um, Mr. Jimenez with the following claims. The uh, the <laughs> the subheading that concludes um, the uh, their review of your book, uh, it has the headline, Shoddy Journalism, Terrible Consequences. I, I guess you're, they're not going to put that on the book uh, with where they put reviews. They actually have an approving review by Andrew Sullivan, but... Uh, here's what Media Matters says, and I want to give you a chance to respond to it, Mr. Jimenez, very directly. Although right-wing media have rejoiced at the arrival of the Book of Matt, uh, actually rejoiced wouldn't be the right word, uh, been fascinated by. Uh, Although right-wing media have rejoiced at the arrival of the Book of Matt, convinced that it exposes an LGBT grievance industry founded on lies and cover-ups, Jimenez's repeated conjecture, unreliable sources, and stubborn denial of blatant evidence of homophobia mark the book as a subpar work of reportage. In the course of his failed effort to upend the public's understanding of Matthew Shepard's murder, Jimenez pays no heed to the reality of LGBT hate crimes. The Southern Poverty Law Center notes that no other minority group is as targeted for hate crimes. However poor the investigative work and unfounded the conclusions Jimenez's book gives aid and comfort to those who turn a blind eye to anti-LGBT violence and bigotry. Does your book do that? Do you turn a blind eye to anti-gay violence? Absolutely not. And uh, what you just read there, Michael, uh, that doesn't sound like journalism to me. Uh, If they're serious about journalism, how about going after some specifics in the book and offering evidence contrary to what I've stated? Uh, I spent a long, long time going through the entire public record in this case. Uh, In the book, there are 112 named sources. Uh, One of my primary sources is the prosecutor who won the the convictions of Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson and the double life terms that they're now serving. Uh, There are police officers in Laramie, uh, uh, Ben Fritzen, who was one of the main homicide detectives. He took Aaron McKinney's confession. Uh, Ben Fritzen has been on the record for quite some time saying this was about drugs and money. Uh, And so when they suggest that this is these are unreliable sources, that's simply not true. Okay, the the basic narrative of what happened, uh, it's it's complicated and you go through it in, in excruciating detail. And even knowing what happens and how tragically it ends up, it's still excruciating. It's like in cold blood, uh, the great. Uh, Truman Capote masterpiece, tracing a, a murder almost step by step. But just if you can do it for our listeners, what really happened uh, that uh, terrible winter night? Okay. First of all, let me say we have to begin with the fact that Aaron McKinney and Matthew Shepard knew each other before that evening. In my research, I trace the fact that there had been Two, at least two previous instances where there was discord between them, discord witnessed by other people. So, and and in both cases, uh, both appear to be appear to be to have uh, been involved uh, with drugs. At least in one of them, for certain, at the library bar in Laramie, uh, one of uh, Matthew's uh, Denver friends dropped off some methamphetamine at the bar one evening to Matthew. Matthew and Aaron went out to a bar. I went out to uh, the parking lot into a vehicle, and uh, the purpose of this was for Aaron McKinney to sample the meth. 
Matthew Shepard had. And he did that. And a short while later, Aaron McKinney stormed back into the bar, irritated, and was using expletives because Matthew Shepard would not advance Aaron McKinney the drugs without uh, without payment. And uh, so there was previous discord between them. But just to say, there were also periods where they were friends. Uh, I describe at length uh, an all-night limousine party when they were out together and they were socializing and enjoying each other. How, how could both prosecutors and defense miss all of this? Well, I don't think that, certainly in the case of the prosecution, I don't think that the, prosec- the prosecution missed it. I think the uh, the case that the prosecution made was a felony murder case, felony murder and related charges. Uh, you know, in other words, uh, a murder that was committed uh, during the course of a robbery. And I think that that was the case, uh, that was a case he presented in court. But you have to realize with the tremendous publicity that happened, you know, all of the media coverage, which happened very, very fast, this was a de facto hate crime within a couple of days. Yeah, one of the striking things, the very beginning of your book, you, you list um, all of the major publications all across the country that uh, laid this down as a case of Matthew Shepard as a gay martyr killed because of anti-gay bigotry. Now, you you recognize there are anti-gay crimes. People are beaten up. People are harmed. uh, And you in no way sanction that or diminish the importance of that issue for our society. Of course not, Michael. Of course uh, there is anti-gay violence. Of course there are crimes that are motivated first and foremost by hate. Uh, But I also, as I said earlier, I think it's important to understand when there are complicated circumstances, when there are complicated motives, let's take a look at that. The uh, judge who sentenced Russell Henderson, Judge Jeffrey Dinell, made the statement in court on the day of the sentencing, and he said many have called this a hate crime, but quite frankly, the court does not find this matter to be so simplistic because it's quite clear that another uh, uh, there were other motives and emotions involved here. And certainly the uh, the motive around methamphetamine is one that was, was really hardly brought up. During Aaron McKinney's trial, uh, his attorneys called an expert on methamphetamine simply to address some of the aspects of Aaron McKinney's personal use. But as far as the... Uh, the sale of drugs and the dealing aspect, that was never brought up during the trials. Do you, uh, would you personally support legalization of methamphetamines? Well, I'll tell you, uh, there, there's a part of me, well, first of all, methamphetamine is an awful, awful drug. No, it's it, a life killer. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, it's may a be life the, stealer. Yeah, it may be the worst drug that we've ever seen. And the research I've done and what it causes, yeah. you know, uh, meth-induced psychosis, the violence associated with horrible... What I was going to say is that there is some part of me, okay, where some drug use is concerned, that I, I frankly am a bit libertarian, okay? But where this particular drug is concerned, what I have studied and what I've learned is this is a horrible, horrible Well, drug. you just read your book. My, my goodness, if, if anyone is concerned about someone potentially using meth, uh, get them a copy of the book of Matt and force that person to read it cover to cover. And they will never consider it. It rots your teeth. It rots your brain. It steals your life. It's a, um, as, as Stephen Jimenez shows so eloquently in the book of Matt, the worst possible thing you can do to yourself. Except we've done some terrible, terrible things to the truth, to the understanding of an already grim case. So what do we do about it to get the truth out there? Uh, We will deal with that and your calls for Stephen Jimenez. His book, The Book of Matt, is posted on our website at michaelmedved.com. 1-800-955-1776. 34 minutes after the hour on The Michael Medved Show with uh, Stephen Jimenez. Stephen Jimenez has uh, impeccable uh, establishment credentials that I guess uh, people are going to try to take away from him now that he has written a wildly controversial book. It is called The Book of Matt, Hidden Truths About the Murder of Matthew Shepard. Stephen is an award-winning journalist, writer, and producer. He was a 2012 Norman Mailer nonfiction fellow. He's written and produced programs for ABC News 2020, for Dan Rather Reports. Don't hold that against him. Nova, Fox, Court TV, and others. He taught for 10 years at the Tisch School of the Arts at New York University at NYU, and uh, he lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and in New York City. 
And um, his book, the book of Matt, uh, basically says that there has been a, a, and that's the point about the book that is most shocking of all, a willful fraud perpetrated on the American people uh, regarding the nature of this particular crime. 1-800-955-1776 is our phone number. And uh, Stephen is going to be appearing twice here in Seattle doing a book signing, answering questions. The information is up at our website at michaelmedved.com. The next day, Portland, and then after that, all across America. That's right. We're only a third of the way through the tour, Michael. Do you um, Have you needed so far uh, protection, bodyguards? No, I haven't. Uh, really, I'll say that most of the bookstore events... There have been just great conversations and discussions. There have been a few people that were agitated about, you know, uh, some people suggested the cancellation of appearances, which didn't happen. And uh, so far, so good. Let's go to uh, Tony in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, Tony, you're on the Michael Med- Medved Show with Stephen Jimenez. Hi, how you doing? Doing well. Great. Um, my, my comments might be a little bit off topic, but... Um... As I was telling the, the, your producer, whoever, uh, I grew up in some of the rougher areas of California in my youth. Um, I started doing meth when I was like 12. And, um, you know, I, that went on and off until I was about 20 years old. I lost a lot of friends. And, you know, even into my 30s, watched people decline. And the absolute catastrophic effect, uh, effects of that drug that it will do to you over time. It's just unbelievable. And I agree that it's probably the worst drug that's ever been seen by man. Are you are uh, you clean now? Oh, I've been clean for for probably 15, 20 years. Well, thank God. Uh, was it uh, That was not an easy process, I assume. Actually, it, it, you know, you take yourself out of the environment and, and it's a lot easier to stay away from um, it, it was just, it no longer was a lifestyle. I mean, it was kind of part of my youth. I didn't want it to be part of my overall, you know, um, being of an adult and who I became and whatnot. You know, it was, it was a choice. So it, it was, it, it was easier for me to walk away from than a lot of, uh, a lot of my friends and whatnot who, you know, you know, passed away, went to prison, jail and, and so forth. And, and I just see a lot of bad stuff. But the one, there's one thing in there that I wanted to mention is that um, I have been addressed and approached inappropriately by homosexual males, and I I I feel almost an aggressive nature. And I personally, you know, I want to react violently against it because I feel I feel it's different. I don't I don't explain it. Um, it's just it's it's different. And I don't know, I don't do it to women, and I wouldn't expect um, a gay male to do it to myself. And I, I have experienced it. It's been hard to refrain from physical violence. Although after hearing you know, more about, about the contents of, of the book, that doesn't really seem to be the case of the overall crime. But that point was made, you know, were brought up. And okay, Steve, extent, Stephen, I, Him, Stephen Jimenez's response. Yes, uh, uh, surely there are crimes that happen. Uh, you know, there can be a crime that happens because uh, a gay person makes an advance on a straight person who's not interested. I think it happens across the lines. I think that happens with straight people, with gay people. In this particular case, uh, this was, uh, an, you know, a, an attempt at a defense, an alibi that Aaron McKinney, one of the perpetrators, used uh, to, in a sense, justify his explosive violence was that uh, that Matthew touched him and therefore he exploded and beat him to death with a 357 Magnum. So, uh, you know, I don't think there's any justification for the violence there. You, you've interviewed Aaron McKinney. Oh, yes, many times. And we will get to what it is that Aaron McKinney says and why it is that uh, Stephen Jimenez is so sure about some of his shocking conclusions in the book of Matt. It's posted up at our website along with the schedule of where Stephen Jimenez is going to be speaking in upcoming days. The Michael Medved Show. MichaelMedved.com I mean, the image of that product on your window. Hurry, take advantage of great October deals, including a free upgrade to sleek-looking cordless, all at blinds. Dot com. 
We're speaking with uh, Stephen Jimenez. He is the author of the book of Matt. He is traveling the country. He'll be in a city near you. He has two appearances in uh, Seattle tonight and then tomorrow night. You can find out about it at our website at michaelmedved.com. If you live in the San Diego area and you want to come out to a live broadcast of this very radio show this Thursday, uh, that's right, this Thursday, October 24th, I will be in San Diego at the uh, La Costa Film Festival at the um, resort in La Costa. You can find out information about it. It's free to come out and sit in and enjoy seeing this broadcast live in all its splendor. 1-800-955-1776. Let's go quickly to Chris in Detroit. You're on the Michael Medved Show with Stephen Jimenez. Hi, Michael. Mr. Jimenez. Uh, Hi, Michael, just a minute. I just wanted to uh, tell you how much I appreciate your show and the level of discourse you have on it. I usually learn something from listening to your show, and that's uh, that's really uh, something very important to me. Well, thank but, you, and uh, it's very important to me what you just said, so I appreciate it. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Jimenez, uh, it, it takes a great deal of courage to do what you're doing to challenge the orthodoxy of the myth of a movement or a religion. Um, I, I'm just wondering, what what changes do you think may come about by you um, challenging uh, one of the cornerstones uh, of the, the present day uh, gay movement? Uh, what, what, what do you see coming from it? Well, to be honest, uh, I really think that the book is really it's really about the story that I'm telling here. I don't think that this uh, changes uh, what's happened in gay rights over several years. I don't think that what we learn about a specific case, that the circumstances were more complex than we originally believed, that that has implications that suddenly, uh, you know, gay rights uh, are going to be rolled back, nor do I believe they should be as a gay man. Uh, but I do believe that there's something to be learned from the complexities of this case. And, uh, m- you know, if we look at things more honestly and we understand the various factors that brought this crime about, uh, perhaps we can prevent similar crimes from happening, whether they have anything to do with gay people, straight people, but any human beings that would be affected by such a horribly violent crime. I, look, you, you read this book and you do what makes it so absorbing is you do have this overwhelming sense of the tragedy involved here. It's just a different tragedy. It's not the tragedy that is uh, generally purported uh, to be out there in the stained glass window version of this crime. Let's go to Joe in Chicago. Joe, you're on the Michael Medved Show with Stephen Jimenez. Uh, hi, Michael and Stephen. It's a pleasure to talk to both of you. And I just I wanted to make the comment that it, it sounds like the um, Matthew Shepard case has, a, has about as much to do with anti-gay violence as the Trayvon Martin case had to do with race relations. Yeah, except the, the, well, the point is that that came out during the trial. Uh, none, very little of this truth came out during the trial, did it? Uh, no, very, very little. Uh, it was there was a very a consistent narrative here. But what I would point out is that I think that the case, both cases, uh, in fact, there's a fellow that has a new book coming out on Trayvon Martin, and uh, he wrote a piece recently. Uh, I believe it was uh, the, uh, for the conservative thinker, in which he talks about the role of the media in uh, both the Matthew Shepard case and Trayvon Martin, and the politicizing of aspects of the cases. So I think there are similarities there. I'm not as familiar with the Trayvon Martin case, so I, I, I'd rather talk about what I know about the Matthew Shepard case. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the public rush to judgment, the media rush to judgment certainly can have a huge impact uh, in writing history very, very quickly. And I think that has implications for all of us. The um, uh, When you interviewed Aaron McKinney, did, did he confirm to you that he knew Matthew Shepard before the killing? No, actually, Aaron McKinney has consistently denied it, uh, that he knew Matthew Shepard. But what I'll say is that, uh, you know, first, I, I had a couple of sources that acknowledged uh, that they had been with the two of them together. And then it just continued until actually I now have 10 on-the-record sources 
who had socialized with them, who had been at parties with them, who were familiar with the intimate relationship they had. So there's a preponderance of sources here that have not have well, acknowledged that. Well, given the fact that he's now serving a, a life sentence, a double life sentence, uh, why would Aaron McKinney continue to deny something like that where you have such overwhelming evidence to the contrary? Well, because I think, uh, first of all, I think it goes to the drug underpinnings of the case. Uh, at the time of the crime, uh, Aaron McKinney owed two of his main drug suppliers money, and I think he went out of his way to keep the names of his other associates and cohorts out of it. For Aaron to be viewed as a snitch in prison would be, for him, the worst kind of thing. In fact... A death sentence. Uh, yes. In fact, after I uh, produced the 2020 piece and I visited him, he was really, really upset and said to me, you don't understand how status works in prison. And... Uh, as crazy as it sounds, uh, you know, th there's a certain truth to the fact that he has status because he was a killer in a famous crime. If he's viewed as a snitch, he will be the lowest of the low. The book is called The Book of Matt, Hidden Truths About the Murder of Matthew Shepard. Some of those uh, truths are very, very well hidden. Uh, the upshot of their exposure with this book, uh, we will get to that and more with your calls for Stephen Jimenez. Coming up. Portions of the Michael Medved Show are sponsored by Wellspring Benefits Group. Learn more at controlmycare.com. 1-800-95... 55 minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show, the book is called The Book of Matt. That's M-A-T-T, -T, of course, Hidden Truths About the Murder of Matthew Shepard. Uh, Stephen Jimenez is the award-winning producer, writer, screenwriter, teacher, who has spent 13 years of his life digging up the truth about one of the most celebrated crimes of recent history. Let's go to Elizabeth in Philadelphia. Elizabeth, you're on the Michael Medved Show with uh, Stephen Jimenez. Yes, hello. I, I just wanted to uh, get your opinion. There is a play that was written called The Laramie Project. Yes. And um, I, I felt like the, the play's focus should be, and I think this is done in high schools throughout the country, but the play's focus should be on this is what happens when you get involved in drugs. And I was just wondering if you felt like the story was... Um, they were manipulating to make a point. Right. Well, just so that people know, if you haven't experienced the Laramie Project, did did any of your children experience that in school? No. Well, um, it's been put on, so I was doing some research about it. Yeah, it's put on all over the country, and it's it's supposed to be uh, a, as a cautionary tale about homophobia. Stephen? Yes. Uh, for several years, the Laramie Project was the most produced play uh, in the United States after Thornton Wilder's Our Town. And uh, I'm sure that there have been some useful discussions that have come from the play being produced in these various, play in these various places around the country. It does trouble me. Uh, I think at, at the heart of the play, you'll notice that Matthew Shepard is conspicuously absent as a character, that, uh, you know, there are a few people that talk about him, but in many, many of the representations, Matthew Shepard, the complexities of who he was as a human being are simply missing. So what I would say is that uh, the Laramie Project purports to be about the reactions of people in the town to the crime. Uh, I would say that it would be useful for uh, the public to understand also more about the actual tragedy itself and what brought it about. Uh, Stephen, I, I, I know recently there's been a lot of talk about courage and what courage means in politics, what courage means in life. I, I do believe that, that a courageous act is one that involves risk. You took risks to research and publish this book, and you were aware of it. Yes, and uh, those risks certainly accelerated over time. Uh, you know, talking to a few people in Laramie about drugs is one thing, but then... Uh, really talking to people more seriously involved in the meth trade, that was dangerous. Yeah, it's also dangerous to your career, as some of the reaction to your book has, has shown. But I do believe that there are there is still a deep, deep American hunger for the truth. 
You can find some of the hidden truths about the murder of Matthew Shepard in the book of Matt. It's posted up at our website at michaelmedved.com, along with the schedule for Stephen Jimenez, who deserves a great deal of credit for his service to this greatest nation on God's green earth. 